Miriam Meets on RTE Radio 1 with Miriam O'Callaghan. Hello there. Paul Muldoon is one of our greatest poets and has published 11 critically acclaimed full-length collections of poetry, including the Pulitzer Prize-winning Moy Sand and Gravel and his most recent collection, Maggot. Rita Duffy is probably Belfast's best-known contemporary artist whose critically acclaimed collections have included Flotilla and Outposts. Both poet and artist were born in Northern Ireland. Both are of the generation that came of age in the Troubles. Paul now lives most of the time in New Jersey, where he teaches at Princeton University. Rita continues to live with her family in Belfast. They've collaborated on two occasions, their work examining the legacies of the past and the challenges of making peace. Four years ago in a project called Cloth and currently in a project called Thaw. You're both very welcome. Thank you very much indeed for having (laughs) us. Right, you're both northerners. Uh, Tell me about yourself first, Rita. You grew up in Belfast? I grew up in Belfast, yep. I was a home delivery in St Ives Gardens in uh, aspiring Stramulus Road. Actually, I'm in the process of moving to the border, to South Fermanagh. After a lifetime in Belfast, I think it's time to have my rural experience. Well, and we'll get to that. But in Belfast, tell me about your family. My mother was from County Offaly and my father was from Belfast. They met in Clara, in a little town in County Offaly. Um, he was installing weaving machinery into one of the Good Buddy factories. And he saw my mother Irish dancing and asked for an introduction. And the rest is history. Oh, they were supposed to live in RD, but thankfully he he decided that he wanted to come back to Belfast. So I was born and brought up in Belfast. I don't think RD would have been quite as interesting. Was she happy there uh, as a southerner growing up? No, no. she never. She always, always had her sense of home in County Offaly, probably because of the pull of her sisters. She had six sisters. You know, we grew up in in a a fairly kind of Protestant working class aspiring area and always felt, I mean, I was 12 or 13 before I realised I actually came from Belfast. (laughs) Such was that kind of dislocation because my father was Catholic as well. So we we, we kind of grew up in in a strange little bubble beside the university. And used to go down back to Offaly? All the time, especially during the Troubles. But more importantly, we were literally on the doorstep of the Ulster Museum and, you know, you'd go in there and, and, and then kind of play around the galleries, take off your shoes and slide on the polished floors. Amazing, amazing stuff to have that kind of world of strange artefacts and bits and pieces from all over the world. And, you know, that kind of mm. environment was an amazing place to grow up as a child. And presumably all those paintings. Absolutely. Yeah. The paintings were the the big thing, you know, the the and 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 that kind of unfettered access to them, you know, literally your the world of the imagination was was just there. You grew up in the Moy. I grew up in the Moy, also in a sort of bubble in a strange way. I'm sort of very taken by Rita's de- description of her family in that regard. My parents were brought up in County Tyrone. Um, and my mother in particular was aspirational, to use a word that Rita has just used, uh, so much so, in fact, that home delivery would not have been good enough for us. Uh, <laughs> we we took advantage of the recently established uh, nursing home, which, of course, has all sorts of connotations, but in that case it meant someone where a child, somewhere where a child was delivered in Carlton House, in this case in Portadown. Um, so um, I, I was born there, brought up for a while in County Tyrone, and then my mother, we moved into a little uh, predominantly Catholic parish in uh, the parish of uh, College Lands in uh, in North Armagh, and we were brought up there. My mother was the school teacher. Uh, my father was, uh, well, he did all sorts of odd jobs. Um, he uh, was a labourer. He... he um, ended up growing cauliflowers and mushrooms so he was a market gardener in that respect Uh, and my first experiences of Belfast in fact were going with him to the George Street market in Belfast where he was attempting to sell a few cauliflowers. All right, I remember that. I have vague memories of being ta- of of going to the poultry market down on Oxford Street before Christmas, and that was at the time whenever everything was separated. You know, the fish was sold in one one area, the vegetables in another. But now it's kind of very trendy, sort of farmers market on a on a Saturday morning, with a bit of music and stuff. And 
Yeah, it was quite a different Belfast then. Were you both closer to your fathers than your mothers? I think I was closer to my father. He had a great sense of imagination. Now, possibly it was because my mother had a great sense of drudgery. Yeah, which you know the hard work? May well not have been her choice. But um, uh, he used to tell us stories and, you know, there was that quite a, you know, an imaginative headspace he had. I remember him telling us stories about um, wearing lead boots. He worked on the, the flying boats, the undercarriage for the flying boats, which were developed during the Second World War. And it was a top secret mission. He had to go to the Isle of Wight and told us about, you know, the putting on the wetsuits and um, which, of course, would have been probably full rubber and wearing these lead boots so that you didn't tumble over. And I, at the time, I remember thinking he's making it up, you know, but it was good. You know, you went with it anyway. And you remember it. I remember this. Yeah. And yeah. and he, I remember hearing him telling my sons the same story and realising those weren't yarns. That was the truth. Yeah. You know, I think it's it continues to be a mystery, I think, for most of us, how and why um, uh, people stay together, live together and are able to stay together for so long. Um, and my parents were very, um, very different. Uh, and But that may have been one of the reasons why they had, I think, in the end, a very good relationship. I mean, the, the family... When I read uh, Sons and Lovers by D.H. Lawrence, I, I immediately connected with that setup of the uh, the working man, the miner in the case of uh, uh, the father, Morel, and then the aspirational, as I said, mother, who sent us out, in, for example, to uh, for elocution and for piano. But she wanted you to do well. She, she wanted had, us. Yeah. I yeah. think you. you know she wanted us to do to do well, and um, you know, and that included, of course, sending us out to the Irish dancing classes too. <laughs> I was kind of amused when you when you mentioned that in your own background. But was she tough on you? In other words, if you ended up maybe closer to your father, was it because was she a hard taskmaster? She was a hard taskmaster, and she she was a she was a tough woman, and I mean there was a certain amount of. Uh, what would one say of uh, of physical, um, you know, a certain amount of beating done in the house, as I think there probably was in many houses in that era. What do you mean beating? Well, I mean she 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 uh, she kept a little cane which she uh, occasionally brought to bear on us in in that era. Probably more probably more common in that era than it is now. Of course, more would be probably put away. I don't, you know, I'm sure we, I'm sure we were driving her crazy, mm. in some sense, and that we probably deserved it in some was sense. Was she affectionate? I think she was affectionate behind behind it all, and I think that, um, you know, I sometimes wonder if in the poems I haven't demonized her a little mm. bit and sort of, you know, made the father into this extraordinarily, um, you know, wh- white, whiter than white, holier than. Uh, the mm. presence. Uh, I don't think it was quite as simple as that. That's a little bit crude, I think, in its geometry. And, you know, as a parent myself now, I think, uh, heavens above, I do understand so much of how she would have, <coughs> first of all, tried to give us as much as she possibly could. I think all her impulses were were good ones. Uh, I'm not sure if she had the complete emotional artillery, as it were, uh, vocabulary mm. to really help us uh, in that regard. Of which stage were you both aware of the backdrop, the violence, the society in which you were both growing up? I think I was aware fairly early on. I mean, the trouble started when I was about 12. I did some work recently where they're bringing Sesame Street to Northern Ireland and the researchers identified that children as young as three were aware of religious divides. Were you aware, Perry? Yes, I was. We were from a, there was a rural background, you know, immediate in our family because of my mother's kind of homesickness. Um, and also my father's um, family were from the Falls Road and we were in the wrong area. So did you mix with Protestants? Yeah, I did, but we didn't go to school together. And that mixture stopped at the end of May you know, in the build up to the 12th of July, you know, there's great excitement gathering wood for the bonfire. I remember doing that one year and my mother kind of calling us in and explaining on no uncertain terms, never, ever take part in that. 
And in the Moy growing up, I mean, there were many terrible areas of triangles, but the Moy was right there in the middle of some of the worst atrocities and violence in Northern Ireland. It was, you know, I, though I think that, uh, of course, uh, every area of, the, of the Northern Ireland was affected, uh, as well as some in, in the South. Um, but that, I suppose, was historically an area in which uh, there was, you know, a certain amount of uh, Republican activism and, uh, for example... And also, um, you know, the, uh, the the fact was that it was an area, as with many rural areas, where there was a memory, uh, and mm-hmm. not a distant memory, of the uh, outrageous behaviour mm-hmm. of, um, well, in particular, the the, the, the uh, group uh, that was partic- that was especially demonised, uh, the B specials, mm-hmm. who. Um, well, as you know, the auxiliary, DR, yeah. auxiliary mm. force uh, in the Royal Ulster Constabulary, as it was then described. What's interesting, though, is you grew up in that area and a lot of people of your generation got trapped into that, got sucked into violence on one side or another. You didn't. I mean, like, there were whole families in the Moy wiped out by the Troubles. There were, alas, and uh, there, there were, in many cases, my classmates in school. They were taught by my mother. I mentioned earlier the idea of living in a bit of a bubble. And I think at some level, um, partly because we were blow-ins, we were recent arrivals from not too far away, but significantly far Mm. enough away to make us really Mm. outsiders in in the community. And that sense of being outside was really, I think, underpinned, underscored by the fact that mom was the the school teacher. Mm. So there was still some sense in uh, in a rural society in particular of that old triumvirate or of the priest, the doctor, the teacher as being somehow these uh, the slightly, slightly removed in society. And I think, you know, frankly, we, we were discouraged, though we had many friends in the vicinity, I think we were discouraged from taking, you know, from hanging out at the crossroads uh, to the same extent as we might, had there not been that tradition in the area of, um, you know, of of, uh, of of violent action. And I think she was concerned that we might have been caught up in it. Mm. And I think, you know, properly so, because um, so many were, and one, one could easily have been. Did you grow up with a sense of being second-class citizens? You know, I, I didn't. I mean, I think we may have been cocooned in some way in that regard. Um, I, and my mother actually was rather wonderfully um, adamant about not being seen to favour one side over another. Uh, we were brought up as Catholics, but rather than go to the, say... The, the Catholic doctor or the Catholic um, car dealer, um, we went, well, to someone else. And one of the glories of that particular area, of the, uh, in fact, um, is that there's a great Quaker community there. And many of our neighbours were mm. Quaker. And so we, we a lot of uh, the people that, uh, you know, who with whom we had uh, business relations, as it were, uh, were Quakers. Uh, but there was a sense, I think, she had a real sense that it was important that people um, get on. Get on. Mm. When you grew up in Belfast, did you grow up, Rita, with a sense of being a second-class citizen? Did you grow up feeling that people around you were trying to make you feel like that? I grew up with the feeling that people around me might have believed that, but I, I never had that sense of of second-class citizen within myself. I had a very strong sense that the system was unfair and I think my mother's attitude um, was very definitely one of embracing education. It was a great it was a great kind of lament of hers that it had been denied to her when she was 13, having to go to work in the factory in Clara, which also was run by Quakers. Um, so she was adamant if she was suffering being alone without her family in Belfast that we should we should definitely benefit from 
all access to education. And I think that was the kind of, that was certainly the one of the reasons mm. why neither my brothers, sisters, nor myself got involved in, you know, directly in mm. any sort of violent politics. There's a poem or pause you really like. Yeah, that was the poem to... that I thought, the sightseers, the one about the Ballygolly roundabout. I think that was one, you know, you come across something, um, as certainly as an artist, whether it's a piece of writing or a, another image or a piece of music, there was something in that poem that spoke loudly to me about my experience growing up in the North. Will you read a poem? Certainly. The Sightseers. My father and mother, my brother and sister and I, with Uncle Pat, our dour, best-loved uncle, had set out that Sunday afternoon in July in his broken-down ford, not to visit some graveyard, one died of shingles, one of fever, another's knees turned to jelly, but the brand-new roundabout at Ballygolly, the first in Mid-Ulster. Uncle Pat was telling us how the bee specials had stopped him one night somewhere near Ballygolly and smashed his bicycle and made him sing the sash and curse the Pope of Rome. They held a pistol so hard against his forehead. There was still the mark of an O when he got home. And for what it's worth, it's it's a true story insofar as we might describe any stories as being true, but certainly based on a story that I heard again and again. So in that regard, there was there certainly was a sense of of, of oppression, uh, but it was perhaps not so deeply felt as I'm sure it was by many of our uh, mm. neighbours. You know, mm. but isn't it wonderful that you can actually have that you know the the impulse to actually turn something so particular, so kind of dysfunctional into something so incredible. I mean, that poem still kind of resonates with me today. Well, I'm delighted to hear that. I mean, you know, I think it's that image of the, the O. Is so it's really, as I said, it's, it's, it's based on something that actually happened to one of my uncles. It's also the, it's also the image of a roundabout, round and round and That's round right. circles that I think speaks volumes about you know peace processes and talks about talks and the 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 kind of eternal nasal mm. gazing gazing that we we nasal gazing navel <laughs> gazing that we go in for. Don't uh-huh. knows what you're uh-huh. doing. <laughs> and we'll come back to all that. We'll we'll take a piece of music. Van the man, Paul. There are so many great songs by uh, Van Morrison. One of his uh, songs, of the many that I like so much, is called Cleaning Windows. Uh, In a strange way, one of the reasons why I chose it today actually had to do with uh, the fact that uh, when I first saw Rita's um, work, which was quite early on, and I think I saw, I used to work for the BBC in Belfast, and one of the things I did was to uh, look after a programme that involved uh, reviews of mm. uh, films, plays, um, concerts, books, and exhibitions. And I think we must have seen your, probably your very first uh, exhibition in, in Belfast. I can't remember what year it was now, but I think it was reviewed by my Cato, from what I recall. And in any case... Um, you know, there was a sense there that uh, one was looking at, as there is, I think, with all great art, that was one, one was looking uh, uh, as if for the first time at something uh, one might have thought one had seen. And in some sense, uh, you know, the, the pain between, that's the P-A-N-E, between ourselves and the world uh, was... Um, cleansed in some way, rinsed in some way, and maybe even though I think this song is from the pre squeegee era, <laughs> squeegeed in some way. Uh, so, anyway, Van, Van the Man with Cleaning Windows. Oh, the smell of the bakery from across the street. Got in my nose. Yeah. yeah, we 
carried our letters down the street with the Royal Iron Gate Rose. So interesting there to hear Van Morrison in the course of the song refer to some of the influences on him. I mean, I think that's uh, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, for example, and that kind of litany of people uh, who, at some level, to whom he would have been responding and thinking in the way that most of us have, mm. um, you know, be it walking through the uh, galleries in the Ulster Museum or. Uh, sitting looking out a window in County Ar- Armagh, or in his case, sitting in, in uh, a back street in Belfast, and thinking at some level, I can do that. Mm. I know it's a bit of a truism. We've heard that phrase so many times uh, about how people get started. Um, but I know in my own case, it was T.S. Eliot who got me off the ground, and thinking not not in some uh, self-regarding or, you know, crazed way I can do that but actually there's something here that is attractive to me and I'm going to have a go at this Just because you loved his poetry so much? I loved T.S. Eliot and in Mm. fact I still do love T.S. Eliot Uh, he was the person who got me started but also you went to St. Pat's in Armagh didn't you Which and you had some really good teachers as well Fantastic, unbelievable I mean the I'm sure it's the case with uh, artists but certainly it's the case with cert, certain it's the case with writers that you know there's always someone who said look um that's okay that's okay to do that and you're not bad at it you're not the worst or whatever the term would be and i certainly had a range of people who did that wonderful teachers who encouraged us to get out there to send our translations for example when we were teenagers to the astrahan column in the irish press to introduce us as another of my teachers did to the work of uh, Kavanagh, say. Mm. This was someone who was coming back from uh, Dublin where he he had almost certainly spent some time, I was about to say done some time, spent some time with Kavanagh. We were hearing about Paul Durkin when Mm. he must still have been a... He was a teenager. Um, And then, of course, another of my teachers who introduced me to uh, a couple of the Northern Irish poets, uh, Seamus Heaney, Michael Longley, whom I met on the same day in April of 1968, and who were just, uh, you know, so um, welcoming. Uh, so been, able, been exposed to uh, the thing itself and then being, let's say, not discouraged. Is the famous story, of course, is when you met Heaney. I'm sure you're sick of telling the story, but the Seamus Heaney said, nothing can be improved in your poems. Tell me that. You know, I honestly, I, I mean, I, no, I'm not sick of hearing it. I, but, but but the trouble is, I don't have much of a grasp on it. I'm told that uh, because I really wasn't how old privy were you? to it. I was um, seventeen. Okay. No. Uh, yeah, I think you I were. think I might have been sixteen okay. still. Actually, I think I was sixteen for what it's worth, just because of my birthday. But anyway. Um, I'm told that the teacher involved, Jerry Hicks, a wonderful man, singer himself uh, and song collector, said to Seamus Heaney, uh, but out of my earshot, naturally, uh, rara avis or something as a queer, queer odd bird or queer bird. So, um, but anyway, I mean, there were... That was tr- about you, he that was, was saying, about but that me. was, you're being now very uh, modest, that was... After Heaney, when he read your poems, didn't he say, what did he say about your poems? Well, I think he said, you know, I sent them to him and he said, well, there's, you know, yeah, he, he was quite nice about them. Come on, what did he say? Well, I'm not sure what he said. Well, what does the, what does, what does, what does history say? He I think said? they said that there was nothing he could uh, improve. improve, but, you know, that's a lovely thing to say. But the fact of the matter is that there's always something that can be improved, you well, know. Well, that's more than lovely if you oh, get Seamus you... Heaney when you're 16 saying that about your well, poetry. Uh, you know what? That yeah. is is absolutely true. And not only that, not only did he say that, but the fact is that he helped me and many others mm. Mm. to get published and helped me to get published in The Listener, which was then the big journal, really, in England, and helped me to get published in mm. Faber's, which were uh, and, and are the, you know, the major mm. English publishers. So he was... So generous. It wasn't just uh, blather. Mm. He actually um, helped us. 
How, just, I'm, I'm just thinking that wonderful Irish phrase, uh, "Mal and Oggy, Oggy's Chuckishy," you know, to, to mm. praise or encouragement mm-hmm, for a praise. child. It's so is important what, to that critical. It's age, massively yeah. important. How did you become an artist? I think it was probably in me for quite, quite some time. I I had great difficulty dealing with a lot of the reality that went on around me, and I think that kind of creative world was something that that I hankered after and kind of went towards. And in primary school, I won a, a little prize. And then I remember an art teacher in St. Dominic's, Denise Ferrin. She's um, an artist herself mm-hmm. now. And she was massively mm. encouraging. And I remember thinking, OK, well, I can do that. I'm good at that. And I felt good about myself doing this. And, and also there was a whole kind of, there was a whole way of navigating and explaining and inquiring and looking at the world that was going on around me through this avenue. And interestingly, even when I look at some of your exhibitions, I mean, your work has been very influenced by the Troubles. Hasn't it? I mean, and also you feel that art is almost, it has a social responsibility at some level if you grow up somewhere like the North. I'm not sure how much of that was circumstance or how much of that was choice. I do remember a conversation at art school when uh, my painting tutor, who had lived in Belfast for 12, 14 years, who was from London, like most of the other um, lecturers at the college, um, they weren't from Belfast. And he asked me in all sincerity, you know, why people were wearing these black armbands. And I explained to him that was because the second hunger striker had died. And I remember thinking, that's really strange, you know, that you could be in a world, you could live in a city, you could be making art, and art should be, maybe, about mm. what you're experiencing, your your reality, your place, you know, that kind of particularness to your world. And with any hope, with any luck, it'll kind of speak to somebody else somewhere else in the world who's having similar experiences and I remember at that time thinking this is strange there's something kind of not quite adding up in that if everything artistic of quality is coming from New York or London where do I fit how do I how do I make anything that's of any consequence for Mm. me and I think that's when I made my decision that I wanted to make art that was about what I was living um, and, and what I was seeing and what I was thinking about. Well, so as we spoke about Kavna earlier, Kavna yeah. showed you could do that for the smallest place. Absolutely. Well, that's right. And, you know, the aforementioned Van Morrison did it also. Um, you know, I remember as a student in Belfast, um, listening, and slightly after that too, listening to, to Van Morrison with the references to the streets. In fact, I lived on Fitzroy Avenue, mm-hmm. which is mentioned in one of, one of his songs, of course. And in a strange way, I, I was taken even then, and I've been more and more taken by the idea that at some level, at some level, Fitzroy Avenue in Belfast didn't quite exist until it had been mentioned in a Van and Morrison so. song. And I think, you know, I, I'm very taken by this it's a fanciful idea of Oscar Wilde's, as so many of his ideas were. He says along the way, there were no fogs before Dickens, no sunsets before Turner, the great painter, of course, who'd, mm. who'd painted these extraordinary uh, sunsets of these. Uh, I don't know if you're a Turner fan. Oh, big Turner fan, but, way before his time. Well, yes, and, you know... It's somehow it hasn't happened until it's happened in art. It's a little bit fanciful. But, it, uh, you know, I certainly think that um, to truly make sense of Northern Ireland, mm. for example, as we've been discussing it, I think while our historians, our sociologists, our geographers, our archaeologists... Our politicians. Our politicians... <laughs> all uh, help us to understand the place to a greater, or in some cases, lesser Mm. degree. You know, at the risk of being fanciful, I do think that if one looks at the uh, the, the art, these images Mm. of Belfast, of Rita's, or listens to some of the music, or reads some of the poetry, or indeed the novels, that one truly begins to get a sense of... uh, of um, the place and what's happening in the place. But that's fascinating. But I always wonder as well, if you are an artist or a writer or a poet from one of the communities, i.e. Catholic or Protestant, do you, are you ever in danger of having your work 
hijacked. I don't think there are two communities. I think there's one community. I and agree. I think it's a fanciful divide that kind of suits some people to see it as a kind of, you know, two communities at each other's throats. There are more similarities and more kind of... I, I certainly regard it as one community and that's my community and I choose to go wherever I want and I work on things that people don't expect me to and and that's the great thing about art. I do think it's one community also. There's much more. We're much more akin. It's in the strictest sense, um, i.e. in the sense of our, our DNA, we're much more akin than, than anything else. I mean... Most people, it's most people want to live their lives as fully as they can without fear and to get through uh, it with as much fulfillment as they can possibly manage. You live in New Jersey a lot of the time now. Do you manage to um, distance yourself? from where you grew up or not? I don't think of myself, uh, crazy though it may sound, as living outside Ireland. And of course I do. I live in New Jersey uh, most of the time. But I'm in Belfast a lot of the time and in Dublin a lot of the time because it is so easy Mm. to get back and forth these days. It takes five hours from Newark Airport, which I, I very close to where I live, to Belfast, for example. And I lived there for so long that when I go back and I'm, you know, walking down Botanic Avenue or whatever it might be, I see someone I know and uh, feel at some level that I've never really left the place at all. Have you brought your children back to the Moy? I have. In fact, I had my daughter. My daughter and I spent about 10 days here, oh, a month ago. She's now 19, so she's of an age where she's, uh, for the first time, I suppose, interested in some, some notion of who she is and where she comes from. So it was fascinating, actually, to go around, uh, you know, some of the, the scenes that were meaningful to me, including the Ballygolly roundabout. <laughs> and, and I'm going to look at this roundabout very differently. <laughs> and, and the, uh, you know, of course, alas, the, uh, the sequence of graves, you know, including my sister's grave in Eglish, uh, where we started out, the, the house in which I was brought up, which I think she found very interesting. You never, you're moving actually, interestingly, into farming, aren't you? Like you're moving a little bit to rural Fermanagh. Yeah, I, Why are I, you spent, doing that? I spent so much time kind of uh, in, ensnared in Belfast, happily so, living very close to where I was born, which always kind of made me a little embarrassed as an artist because I figured visual artists were supposed to have much more exciting times than that. But it did give me an enormous sense of continuity and being able to kind of, uh, you know, walk my sons along the same street and down the same little uh, areas that, that I was totally familiar with so the, yeah this this big jump has happened over the space of a few years did you find when you went out of the city to live more rurally that your work changed that your landscape changed back in january we were out walking and i came across i i found my first fermana painting there was minus 15 it was really cold and a young bull had walked out onto thin ice and drowned in the lake and we came across this frozen bull kind of galloping in the air and it seemed to me a perfect image of contemporary Ireland you know it's rural it's political and it's very much of its time you know I was thrilled to be uh, able to see uh, a version of that painting I suppose a PDF or Mm. whatever we call them nowadays in this modern world one of the glories of the age actually is that one may share uh, <laughs> share too much in some uh, in some cases, but share significant uh, parts of one's life, also. And I w- I was delighted to see uh, early on 
this image from Rita. And I think you were thinking about what you were going to entitle it. Yeah, well, I mean, who else would I ask? You know, I mean, when I when I looked at the image, there were, a, you know, several titles. And, and then I got myself into a bit of a flap about what exactly would be the right title. And you, of course, came up with Bull Market, which was perfect. You know, I'm very interested in the relationship between uh, words and image. And I think yeah. most most poets actually are very, mm. I think, are very visual which is why it was such fun to uh, to do that uh, cloth book with Rita, but also to be involved in, um, you know, finding ways at which uh, in which uh, word and image may connect. And that's mm. been one of the things that we've been able to do over the years. And I'm delighted, for example, to see uh, um, Rita has also used a phrase from this poem, uh, which is called Hedge School, uh, the phrase is Guantanamo, a mass, a mat. And I'll maybe read a bit of the poem and you... Yeah, I'll talk about the picture. Head school. Not only those rainy mornings our great-great-grandmother was posted at a gate with a rush mat over her shoulders, a mat that flashed papish, like a heliograph. But those rainy mornings when my daughter and the rest of her all-American Latin class may yet be forced to conjugate Guantanamo, a mass, a mat, and learn with Luciana how headstrong liberty is lashed with woe. All past and future mornings were impressed on me just now, dear sis, as I sheltered in a doorway on Church Street in St Andrews, where in 673 another well done was bishop, and tried to come up with a ruse for unsealing the new shorter Oxford English Dictionary back in that corner shop and tracing the root of metastasis, um, which of course refers to my sister's cancer, which brought her uh, eventually to the graveyard in English. But the Guantanamo amass amat, in one sense, is a smart Alec uh, reference to the Latin amo amass amat, uh, make, but bringing in uh, what I actually take to be one of the greatest uh, problems with uh, the American uh, world view right now. Guantanamo, I think, continues to stand for. I don't know the uh, the fact that uh, America, which for so long was somehow able to present itself as a moral uh, force in the world, I, I fear is no longer able to do so. That painting um, I made after Obama became president, and one of the things he had said, very hopefully, very grandly, was that he would close Guantanamo Bay, and I remember. Uh, when I saw those men in orange suits on the television, feeling there was something deeply, deeply problematic about the way they were dealing with this notion of terror and threat. And when Obama came out with that statement, I just was a moment of hope. And I had an, a, an orange jumpsuit that I used to wear in the studio when I was painting. And, you know, that painting collided and came into being. We're going to take a piece of music, but interestingly, you started talking about Guantanamo and Paul out of that, and yet the poem was also, as I knew, about your sister's death. Is it wonderful if you're an artist to be able to put down in those words a memory for someone who was so special to you, or is it just an incredibly difficult thing to do? I think it varies, but, uh, you know, again, um, I'm sure one of the things that one's trying to do, the most basic thing one is attempting to do, is to make sense of one's life. Do you set out to make some of your work very difficult? No, certainly not. I mean, I know... No, 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 no. I mean, I know some of it is a bit difficult. I mean, it is difficult. I mean, my of course, my response, when that's raised quite understandably, is that, you know, we live in a difficult era, you know? But you know when you're onto something. You know when it's kind of when it gels or when it kind of comes together. Yes, I mean one hopes it's, it's like you have to try harder again. <laughs> one hopes one's right in that, of course. I mean, the terrible thing is that one may be wrong. Hmm. You know that one may just have got it wrong. Um, 
that one I think physically even physically even there may be there may be a uh, a connection you know Emily Dickinson has this great uh, description of how she recognizes poetry when when the when the the hair on the back of her head stands up. I think one does recognise mm. that somehow. No tears in the writer, or perhaps the painter, the artist. No tears in the reader, according to Robert Frost. So one is the first person to experience that. And at some level, uh, if it doesn't happen for you, mm. and if you don't have that feeling, it's not going to happen for anybody else. But of course, we are occasionally, maybe often, mistaken. Mm. But interestingly, the collaboration that one of them, you did cloth together, but mm. you're doing this one called Thaw, which involves a lot this big iceberg. Explain what it is. We were literally thinking of uh, sort of going against the flow and sort of bringing the iceberg on which the Titanic, or a version of the iceberg in which the Titanic foundered, of course, and the Titanic that has come to uh, represent uh, somehow... Uh, something of the the state of Northern Ireland um, with all its uh, wonderful uh, rigidities uh, and and sometimes it's less than wonderful rigidities um, that somehow we would bring the iceberg to Belfast itself and propose metaphorically that there would be a, a thawing of some of those... Um, coolnesses that did exist over the years and alas still do exist but quite a lot of the Protestant community don't like the idea of the iceberg do they? Quite a lot of them did like it okay. quite a lot of the artistic community didn't like it um, and, and an enormous amount of the international community thought it was fascinating um, I mean as a as a generator for for artworks it certainly was a large idea. And there's going to be an exhibition, isn't there, in spring 2012. Will you have an iceberg there by then? Well, you'll just have to come and see. <laughs> Where'd you go to get an iceberg? You Newfoundland, can't buy it in Newfoundland's the Newfoundland's a pretty good place to go. <laughs> well, Are you going did... to get it? <laughs> <laughs> well, funnily enough, we did spend some time together in a, in a spot where if there weren't icebergs, there was something very close to them in Tromso in Norway. But look, as we close, Paul Muldoon, you're not just a poet. You now, you're a rock, you're a member of a rock band. You are a guitar. How many guitars do you have? I have one or two, more than well, my... You have about well, five. I, I can't really speak in case my wife hears this. <laughs> <clears throat> You know, I am not really a musician myself. I play a couple of chords on a guitar, and I love doing it. You're in a but band. I'm in a band, but I'm the. Per- you know, there's always one person in a band who shouldn't be in it, and I'm the one. <laughs> you know, what I am fascinated by is is uh, the business of attempting to write songs. It's my idea of uh, a really fun time is attempting to write a song. So I've written a lot of lyrics, and many of them we've been recording them. We have a, a band called Wayside Shrines, and I can't promise that we'll be, you know, bursting upon an unsuspecting public, but we hope to have a few things uh, out next year, and I, I hope then that uh, people will like them. And we're going to go out listening to one of the songs you've written. Bruce Springsteen is going to sing it for us now, I gather. This is a song I wrote, or, or co-wrote, as they say, or wrote with, I don't know, that's slightly redundant, wrote with uh, Warren Zevon, the great... Um, singer-songwriter. But Warren Zevon himself, alas, died um, not long after we wrote this. And uh, just after his death, Bruce Springsteen uh, sang the song uh, at a concert, I suppose, and and, uh, just started his concert and sang this in Warren's memory. We've come to the end and it just remains for me to thank you Rita Duffy, Paul Muldoon Paul your latest collection is just out Maggot Rita best of luck with your collaboration on Thaw and I know the exhibition is going to open in spring 2012 in the F.E. McWilliams Gallery and Museum in Banbridge My thanks on sound today to Noel Roberts to my producer Eileen Heron I'll be here at the same time next Sunday thank you very much for listening and we're going to go out now with Bruce Springsteen singing My Rides Here written by Warren Zevon and Paul Muldoon I was staying at the barrier with Jesus and John Wayne. I was waiting for a chariot. They were waiting for a train. The sky was full of carrion. I'll take the Mazuma. 
said Jesus to Mary, that's a 310 to you, my ride's here. My ride's here. Miriam Meets on RTE Radio 1 with Miriam O'Callaghan.